So my name's Ricky Hill. I'm a uh, wireless and SCADA security consultant. I work in the uh, D.C. metro area. Uh, specifically, our, my office is out of, out of Reston, Virginia, Tenassee. Um, I've done previous DEF CON talks along a similar vein here. I love flying things with uh, uh, all kinds of wireless equipment and other technical stuff on them. Previously, I did the war rocketing. It's been about probably about eight years ago where we launched a wireless access point and, and uh, collected data over about 30 square miles. And it was good, but we didn't get a lot because you can't, watch, you can't launch rockets in, in uh, urban areas, right? It was a rural area. Uh, the other talk I did here that I'd done previously was war ballooning. Um, they actually banned us from doing, they initially gave us permission to do that. We had a, a balloon with a um, Kismet drone payload that we were going to fly over DEF CON that year. That was five years ago. Unfortunately, the city banned us and we couldn't do that. So we went to a church 10 miles out from the, uh, from the airport to make it legal. Yes. Hey, Rick. Hey. Pretty good. What's up? Yes. So we have this tradition at DEF CON for first time speakers. You all know the drill. Oh, no, no. However, no. however, we have it on good authority that this gentleman is a liar. And he, in fact, just wants a shot because, and by the way, pour the drone one. Actually, I changed my mind. This is excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, we'd, we'd like to uh, raise your hand if this is your first DEF CON as an attendee. Humans only. Come on, you liars. Wait a minute. You, the blonde. You raised your hand, didn't you? I can barely see under these lights. I hope your hair is blonde. Come on up. <laughs> All right. First time attendee. All right. Did we? Good stuff. Did you? Uh, yep. Oh, I'm telling you. Thank you. Hey, Bob, how are you doing? <laughs> the, the drone gets one. Where's mine? Uh, absolutely. I you, oh, the drone gets one? Yeah, I told you to pour one for the drone. <laughs> It's already been dunked in beer, so it's not, it's not an issue. So wait, what's your name? It's fairly Crystal. waterproof. I actually work for the temple. Oh, you do? Oh, yeah. okay. Well, um, everybody, this is Crystal. Crystal, this is everybody. All right. Crystal. Let's hear it for the drones, for the drone and Crystal's first time at DEF CON. As you were. The drone could never give it to Ricky. Have another okay. shot. Give it to Ricky. It's yours. Uh, all right. Yes. Don't blame the next slide on me. <laughs> Where was I? All right. So what is? What's? <laughs> give me a bit. Yeah, he's got a good point. Um, I don't want to cut anybody up, so we might, we might fire it up a little bit later. Um, so what is this talk about? It's about network surveillance. It's not about, I don't know if you guys saw it about a month ago, but uh, uh, cleaners in Philadelphia, um, as, a, as a gag, did this, and they're delivering their, their dry cleaning on guess which drone. That's the Phantom drone right there. And this thing, believe it or not, will lift uh, probably about two pounds, at 400 grams, whatever that works out to. So. Um, uh, beer, beer works. I haven't tried the full six pack. I understand some guys have. So here's, here on the screen is what I plan to cover today. Um, first we'll look at the advantages of, of doing uh, wireless surveillance from the air. You've got line of sight to everything. It's a real easy way to get um, all the access points in a large area. Uh, from a uh, reconnaissance perspective. Next, we'll explain how this year emerging technologies have made this a possibility. Two years ago, these, what's the payload that you see loaded on this drone would not have been possible because uh, of, the, of the power requirements and the, and the size of the microelectronics on it. Um, in particular, we'll talk about the electronics and the, the Hack 5 software improvements in that. And it has something on it called a cotton candy computer, which is basically a USB stick that runs full Ubuntu or Android. 
Uh, finally, I want to cover how I built, uh, designed, built, and flew the Phantom surveillance drone. Um, I think you guys will like it. We've got a lot of good video here. You'll witness successes as well as some of our uh, oops moments that we encountered flying the drone. Um, we flew a lot of missions during June and July of this year. All right, so the talk is really about the goodness of aerial wireless surveillance. My previous attempts have been problematic. As I mentioned, the, uh, the rocket had problems because the whole flight was like four minutes, right? Even, even from 10,000 feet, you're not going to get a lot of information in that amount of time. The, uh, the balloon suffered from similar things. When you launch a balloon this over the Vegas skyline, we managed to capture Luxor and several of the strips access points from quite a distance out. I think it was like seven to 10 miles. But when you launch a balloon, it's not a real stable platform. It tends to do this, right? So the video from that venture looked a lot like Blair Witch. It was, it was pretty sickening. Um, so next we'll talk about what others have done, what you see on the screen here. Uh, there was a contest that I, how I got the idea for this talk called DARPA UAV Forge. DARPA UAV Forge was about um, a fly-off competition to design a small drone that would fit in a soldier's rucksack, basically fit on its back, which is why the small drone. And its purpose was to go out and land on roofs, houses, buildings, towers, whatever, and conduct visual surveillance. Like it would have been very useful, for instance, in the Boston bombing, if you could have had surveillance anywhere you wanted it, right? Um, so that was the military's purpose in this. The top picture you see there is the AV Forge's Halo team uh, above the competition course. The other attempts uh, at wireless surveillance, if some of you remember it, is the Black Hat's WASP, WASP cellular, that yellow airplane, cellular and wireless collection spy plane. Um, it was pretty expensive. I think it was military surplus. It cost about $6,000. The problem with all these is that are people that fly drones, some, some now want to fly them continuously in the air. Well, when you're flying, you're using a heck of a lot of energy, right? I mean, you, you don't have fuel tanks like a 747. You're burning up battery power like mad. The advantage of this one, of course, is that it can land and then shut off the motors. So UAV Forge, entered, the UAV Forge contest, as I mentioned, introduced a very novel and progressive idea. Uh, that is a perch and stare surveillance, right? If you can land on something, you can shut down, conserve your battery power, and then conduct uh, wireless, cellular, whatever other operations you want to, because those electronics in the payload are going to use a lot less power. Um, so I've extended upon the UAV Forge concept expanded upon that primarily to perform network surveillance and expo exploitation. How many of you guys in here know what, what a uh, pineapple is? All right. <laughs> How many have used the pineapple? Excellent. Excellent. Um, keep in mind throughout this presentation, it, it's a proof of concept for what can be done. Uh, and what the military wanted, I'm not, I'm not encouraging anybody to go out to their land on their coffee shop roof or, roof or terrorize their neighbors. What you do after you learn, uh, with what you learn in this talk is, is up to you. So UAV Forge, 143 teams competed from 153 countries. Guess what? Nobody won. Nobody met their criteria for landing on a, for perching on a roof and uh, collecting photos and coming back. They did require some autonomous operation, but not full autonomous operation. Does anybody know what the difference between a UAV or UAS uh, and a drone is? Um, okay, go ahead. Really? Yeah, yeah, well, well some people don't know. Pilot on the loop, pilot in the loop, the different levels of, of autonomy. And yeah, exactly. The key word is autonomy. So, uh, the Phantom is an autonomous drone in the, in the fact that it will return to home base without any pilot intervention. Uh, otherwise, it's just like a UAV. It'll fly with pilot control. So 
uh, full drones. Autonomous operation, in fact, was one of the Achilles heels of UAV forge because uh, things like trees got in the way, right, that weren't on Google Maps. Okay, well, guess what? It doesn't do trees well. So here's, here's a review of, of uh, UAV Forge. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's pretty self-explanatory, a lot of crashes. Out of all those teams, I've had a dozen teams in the final competition, the average time to crash between takeoff and crash was three minutes, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's just ludicrous, right? And this is only two years ago. So that's what I want to impress upon you is how much the technology's changed. Um, that's not a good bet for an aircraft that cost upwards of $10,000, right? I don't, I don't even think the Army wants to buy that. Well, I don't know. Yeah. All right, so the Phantom just came out in January of this year. I found out about it because a friend of a, a, friend, of a friend I work with was doing some Grand Canyon uh, whitewater rafting, and she said her... her uh, her cousin or whatever ran this company that does that flies phantoms and other uh, drones over the Grand Canyon, films people going down. The uh, phantom also comes with a GoPro mount, if you guys are familiar with sports GoPro cameras. Excellent pictures from the air. So that's how I got the idea and, and, and bought, went out and, and I was addicted once I saw all these videos on YouTube. I'm like, oh, this thing is really cool. Look what I can do with it. And furthermore, you know, it's, it flies really good. I can't tell you how many of the little RC helicopters I've crashed. I mean, I, I suck as a pilot, right? So um, I suck as a pilot, but you know what? GPS, accelerometers, and all the guts inside that thing make me rock. They are great. Um, it also has other fa safety features built in, such as the two, a, a, a two-stick startup. What that means is, if you've ever flown RC before, is if you accidentally turn on it with the uh, throttle up, then you can like eat up your friend's hand, you know, fly up into the ceiling if you're indoors, whatever. One stick is easy to get out of way, but right, like I, like you can see here, it's not going to do anything with one stick. It requires positive, both hands to the left to take off. Very nice feature. Um, I also consider the return to home capability that they advertise and works, you'll see it in just a bit, to be the most valuable. If for any reason your flight gets into trouble, guess what? You can just turn off the, the transmitter here. The drone says, okay, I lost communication, or, or even if my battery goes low, I'm going to come back to where I took off from. So... Uh, the technological improvements that I taught, that I spoke about earlier, the cotton candy computer was one. It was. Let, let me just show you that. I've got one right here. So the cotton candy is is basically this white USB stick. It debuted at the 2011 Computer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. This thing runs full Ubuntu or Android operating system. Um, it makes a excellent platform for hooking in, for instance, this Y-Spy spectrum analyzer. Um, it also can do Zigbee collection, if you, if you guys are familiar with the Zigbee and the uh, kill, killer bee, Joshua Wright's killer bee. Um, we've ran all of those payloads on the, on the, uh, on the drone in the last month. Let me put my drone back up. It's lonely here. And, and finally, I can't emphasize how much of a joy this thing is to fly. It's just, just incredible when it's in GPS mode. So um, anybody fly helicopters? RC? Okay. We, we got a few people. How many crashes have you had? <laughs> okay. That, that says it all right there. All right, so this is a look at the two payloads. Sorry, the pictures are a little fuzzy. Uh, 
uh, again, the, the main payload we've used for this thing is the, is the uh, Hack 5 Pineapple, which you can see underneath the copter right here. And of course, the other one I have is a cotton candy I just showed you. Um, the pineapple required quite a bit of modification and quite a bit of work to get going because lofting things in the air requires a lot of power, so it required a custom power supply. And uh, for instance, on the swap space on the Unix system required UUID mounts instead of regular mounts. It literally took me like a month to get that payload configured. And I finally got it configured with a T-Mobile GSM modem because all the other ones, they just suck power. The CDMA, the typical uh, USB stick modems just suck power. So my opinion, Cotton Candy is the perfect headless computer to use for, for, uh, for an aerial payload. Uh, the trick with it is because it takes power from its USB port is once you connect the USB port and put it on the helicopter, you just killed your computer, right? Well, there's a workaround for that. You supply it with a uh, LiPo battery power and an Apple Bluetooth and keyboard. Guess what? You can now detach your Bluetooth key, uh, keyboard and mouse, and you're good to go on the helicopter. You've got whatever you, you want running is now still running, right? So uh, in my case, it's AeroDump NG, it's uh, Wi-Spy Spectrum Analyzer, and the other payloads that we've talked about before. Basically, any USB device that you can run, you can fly with this, with this uh, cotton candy computer. All right, so let me show you what the, uh, the cotton candy looks like. It actually will also act as a virtual computer when you plug it into a laptop. So let's do that. I did pray to the demo gods. <laughs> no, but I took two shots. <laughs> okay, installing device driver software. Here we go. Okay, the goat will happen next time, sorry. Come on. <laughs> All right, I'll know next time. Let me, let me know, uh, do you have goats for sale? Please. All right, this is our first flight with the uh, WASP spectrum analyzer. This is a neighborhood uh, overlooking a lake. It happens to be a neighborhood overlooking a lake in Culpeper, Virginia. Uh, so it's a cool place to fly choppers because uh, there aren't many trees on waterfront properties, right? So it's easy to fly and buzz neighborhoods, do whatever you want, right? That's why we chose it. This is the collection off that. Um, approximately, we flew approximately out to about 200 feet and got all this, all this data. This particular subdivision only had about 20 houses, and uh, we did a 10-minute overflight. So as you can see, there's a lot of stuff on Channel 9, uh, plenty, plenty of data there. Okay, so we found a lot of wireless sources, so now what? Uh, well, the now what is... Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to make sure I'm not skipping something here. We found 802.11 sources, so okay, big deal, right? Well, that's when I got the idea to do the wireless pineapple. 
Um, the Hack 5 Pineapple provides numerous wireless uh, survey and exploitation packages. You can even do Metasploit on the Pineapple. Pineapple basically is a, ra is a, is a router that acts as a man in the middle for unsecured wireless networks. Um, if, if you connect and Android phones, I've captured a number of Android and, and Apple phones that connect instantly to it. Basically, I'm man in the middle and I'm providing your internet connection so I can do anything I want, right? Um, again, this, this, uh, the payload objectives for the pli fi flying pineapple were the same as for DARPA. That is to land on a unique vantage point that can be a cell tower, it could be a, a hotel balcony, uh, it could be a, you know, anything you can think of that's hard to get to, right? Conduct your operations and return the Phantom safely to the starting point. So I'm lazy, I don't want to construct the standard Visio diagram, so I just did the, uh, I stole TAC-5s. Uh, th thank you, Darren and Robin. This is episode 1112. How this works is that the team, there can be a wireless exploitation team on the internet anywhere, and through the GSM modem, they're going to be able to talk to the, the pineapple and conduct operations on the pineapple. That's, that's how it works. There's a relay server we call Hawaii that's out on the internet that enables that. Here's a short list of the uh, pineapple's capabilities. Uh, as you see, URL snarf, DNS spoofing, uh, SSL strip. AeroDump NG runs great in flight because it doesn't transmit anything. The only other thing I would caution you, if you want to, if you want to do this project, this is 2.4 gigahertz, okay? If you're running that with the receiver on board to Phantom and you're doing uh, wireless ops with the payload, guess what? You're in the same band. You may not be looking so good. They're... Theoretically, it's supposed to work. I've seen numerous blogs on the internet for you just crashed your $700 Phantom. So monitor mode, mode only in flight is, is, the, is, the, uh, is the way to go, and that works. Uh, that sucks. Sorry. I'm going to skip here. I forgot to show you this video. This is pretty cool. Watch this. This is the return to home feature of the Phantom. So basically what I did is take this thing out in a field. This is my last test that I did, by the way. I turned off the transmitter, and you can see it landed near my gym bag like three feet from the same point it took off from. That's the GPS and the, and the nauseam controller on it. All right, so the next mission we did was we went out on my Sea Ray boat and we decided a good place to check to see how many people had wireless was on the beach. At this particular beach is, is at Lake Anna. Uh, we ran Airmon NG, as I've spoken about before, and no, we were not looking for bikinis. We were just looking for how many, how many people were using their Androids and, uh, uh, and other wireless devices on the beach. Notice the uh, pylons added to the uh, drone. Worked quite well. If you guys know kids' noodles, I mean, I know that one will support me above the water, so it worked, worked, worked really cool. 
we're, we're flying out here uh, about like one of those little advertising planes does at, at, at you know, Virginia Beach. And we just buzz the whole beach area, which is probably about a football field long. So you can see right here. So down at the other end, you know, we started to get people's attention. Thank goodness the lifeguards did not chase us off. But um, high altitude of about 100 feet here. And we're collecting all while we're flying, right? I'm running on low on time here, so I'm, I'm going to speed this up. Here's the landing. The battery went dead. Watch this. It actually died. I actually had no control at that point. My friend, Mr. Nick Hopler, jumped in and did helicopter search and rescue. I have never seen a man swim so good. He jumped in, boom, held the thing out, got it, held it over his head, and swam like 50 feet back to the boat. So incredible. Actually, 100 feet. Thank you, Nick. All right, so I had bragged to one of my friends that um, I had not crashed the Phantom yet, and we'd been doing ops with it about a month. And unfortunately, there were some old no moments, but I, I think you'll find these interesting. Uh, we now have moved on to the phase where we've, we've done aero collection and we're going to do the DARPA thing where we want to land on and collect information from roofs or other interesting places, right? So the first thought was, well, let's perform a test flight. And the second thought is, let's, let's land on a balcony. Hey, you know, we could, we could land on the Marriott or whatever and, and just check out somebody's room and, and do the pineapple wireless thing, right? Okay, we'll see how that looks. This is test flight number one. Okay, pan right. This was a stormy evening, fairly, win fair fairly windy. Uh, I'd had only two beers at this point, not two shots, but watch. Yeah, that's about 75 feet at least, so not, not so good. What you, what you see here on stage is Phantom V2. Oops, one more clip here, so... This is our balcony shot where we were trying to land on a balcony just to see if it could be done. There you go. Oh, no! Okay. About an inch short on that leg, watch. Damn, you're a good man. <laughs> also, Mr. Nick Hopler. There you go. This is a look at the reconstruction of the Phantom. What you, what you see in the center there, that red thing, is the Nazim controller, very sophisticated, uses uh, a GPS, accelerometer, and even uses a compass on the leg there in order to orient itself in space. I've seen advertised GPS uh, that it's no better than like six to nine feet or something. This thing actually does better than that. It, it does a space about this wide and it will hover in place with that controller. Uh, it, the Phantom has no moving parts other than the propellers on top there. What you see on the ends are the, called the ESCs, the electronic speed controllers there on each, each uh, thing. The damage, the only damage this thing had was one of the ends right here. You can see the end when it did that full head-on uh, impact. 
It bent at about 20 degrees so that that particular propeller was off. The only way to fix that, it's like a crustacean. It's got a hard shell. The new shell's 60 bucks. So that's 60 bucks and about an eight hour rebuild. All right, so, so mission number three is actually attempt to do the, uh, the DARPA mission. That's do a, a rooftop landing. We did quite a few rooftop landings. I'm going to show you the best one here. Uh, we ran Airmon NG, and before we landed, after we landed, we did site surveys. We did some URL, URL snarfs. And I can tell you, these, you know, by virtue of wireless, these are great vantage points because you land on somebody's roof, guess what? You don't, you don't need a high gain antenna. You're there. So, so the thing is, this is with a zoom lens. This thing is actually pretty far away. The problem is, if you, uh, as a pilot, attempt to start to land on a roof, you lose. The farther the object is from you, the more depth perception you lose, right? So there is an onboard camera. I can show you guys after, but it's, it's about the size of a postage stamp. Uh, first person view camera that I'm looking at to see what's on the roof. So if you're wondering why I'm hanging up there, there's a, there's a corrugated thing on the platform in front with about this much dip on it that I'm wondering if I can ever get my helicopter off. I'm like, no, you know, that doesn't look so good. Let's back up a hair here. So decided to abort the rooftop landing and go for the actual platform there. So there's the chopper going down. This is a clubhouse on the lake, by the way. There you can see their lawn chair, their grill. There were no people here, thankfully, at this point. Now we all held our breaths as we, uh, well, actually, actually, we, we, did, we did a few ops before this. The, the video's been clipped together. But we held our breaths and did the takeoff, and voila. All right. Thanks. So we did encounter a couple places, and what you have to worry about when flying drones or you're doing surveillance is, uh, you know, if, if you're doing private property or whatever, that people might be pissed off that you're trying to collect their wireless or flying a drone outside their window. Right? I mean, it's natural. I, I personally have shotguns for that purpose. Watch this. Oops, we're not going to stay here. Let's get the hell out of there. That thing will do 35 miles an hour, by the way. <laughs> These are just a few of the few of the results. I know they're hard to see, but SSL strip. Uh, I actually hacked and got my own password with SSL strip. Basically what it does, it, it, it collects. Uh, as man in the middle, you don't have SSL anymore, right? Because I'm, I'm providing your internet. You all snarf the same way. 
I'm basically getting every every website you're going to. So that's that's results there. Um, we did compare ourselves to UAV Forge team scores. I know they're hard to see, but the scores go from zero to 100. And all the teams failed. Nobody even made the baseline. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. Let's go down one here. One team, Team Halo, made uh, 47 points. The Phantom, if we score it by the, the score, uh, it scored above like 10 out of 12 helicopters two years ago based on autonomous return to home, uh, avoiding obstacles, and, and other baselines. If you want to see more, want to learn more about drones in, U in UAV Forge, go look at UAVForge.net. Uh, it, it's a very interesting contest, and, and you can see a lot more crashes there. So, future work, uh, we pretty much proved that Perch, Listen, and Engage uh, for will work for wireless network sur surveillance. Uh, it's also a highly effective site survey tool. The takeaway from this is that, um, you know, it, drones and UAVs can be used for good or bad, right? I mean, they can use, be used to peer in people's windows. They can be used to collect, uh, wa collect information at coffee shops, other important places. Or they can be used over for, by the military overseas. You know, they're sort of, you know, it's, it's, in, the, it's in the mind of the beholder, uh, basically, right, as to what they're used for. Uh, we hope they're used for good. So keep that in mind if you guys are interested in flying or keeping drones flying, because now right now the FAA is evaluating who's going to be able to fly drones in the United States and, and where. And that's due out, I believe, mid-2014 or 2015. Right now I flew under the rules that say no commercial entity sponsored me. I'm flying under model um, association rules wherein I have to maintain an altitude of under 400 feet. If any of you guys fly, I employ you, implore you, um, and here's the disclaimers, to not fly this without experience. If you, don't, if you don't have experience flying a drone, you know, don't start with a $700 helicopter, right? Also, don't fly anywhere near an airport because 400, uh, 400 feet is, is not a lot. I, I was going to do a, before we decided on our lake trip, uh, I went to a place near the Potomac River, which, as you know, borders D.C., and thought, oh, this is a cool resort. Let's do some drone operations here. Bad idea. Went out there. A bunch of golfers were under my balcony. You already saw the balcony crash where Nick collected the copter. Well, that would have been a golfer's head, right? Think about it. The other thing is over, over the Potomac, there's uh, the approach to Reagan National Airport, which was about 10 miles out. I thought, well, there couldn't be any airplanes there. They're going to be thousands of feet up. No. They're like 800, 1,000 feet, well within the capability of this drone. So, bad idea. If you're going to fly anywhere, make sure you get with somebody in an R local RC club or, or whatever uh, and make sure that, that you're doing the right thing and you're not endangering people, right? It's all fun. We, we had a great time doing this. Um, this, is, this is one tip I have for you, and I can show you guys afterwards. Uh, it's an altimeter. It's just a it's just a USB stick basically, right? You can get on the elevator, punch punch the zero at the bottom floor, and tell how high you got, right? It fits well in just about any copter you want to fly. What's 400 feet for the for the Phantom? It's about as far as you can see. When it starts to get to where you can't see it anymore, well, you know, you're you're too high. You're 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 in aircraft space now. So, um, again, that's about it. Let's see what we got here. Uh, some shout outs to Nancy Alpha Hop Ops team helped me out a lot for the, with this as far as the flight operations uh, Nick Hoppler in, part in particular uh, Mr. Search and Rescue right here thank you very much Nick <laughs> and, and the hobby hangar in Chantilly Virginia I had the advantage of having two blocks from my house I can go out and get parts for the Phantom or whatever I want right so uh, I will leave you this w with this uh, final thought here on the screen. Thank you very much. <laughs>